Welcome back to another episode of the Relevant Recruiter Show. Today I've got a great guest. Today I'm going to be joined by the GOAT himself, Jeremy Jensen. Jeremy is the founder of Encore Search Partners, which provides headhunting services specifically for industry-leading technical sales professionals, engineers, financial advisors, attorneys, CPAs, and C-level executives nationwide. Now, if you haven't been following Jeremy on LinkedIn, you should probably start doing that today. He creates some killer content, and this guy is an absolute machine out in the marketplace. So I'm really excited to pick his brain. We're going to be talking about how Jeremy's gotten to seven figures, what his plans are for getting to eight figures. Jeremy, thank you so much for hanging with me today on the Relevant Recruiter Show. Awesome, man. Thank you, Donnie, for having me on, bud. All right on. So out in the Houston-based market, before we get into the fun business stuff, I mean, what's going on in the personal life? Anything fun, exciting going on? Oh, um, I have a dating podcast. It's called What Men Want. Uh, you can find it on Apple Podcasts and on Spotify. That's probably the most ex uh, exciting thing that's happening uh, in the non-business world for me. So uh, there you I, go. Yeah. What men want is that geared towards males or females, or is it just it's geared towards females? Man, I can tell you the story <laughs> on why I started it, but it's mission accomplished. I'll put it to you that way. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you, man. That's awesome. That's yeah, yeah. awesome. I'm divorced. So. Divorced uh, two years. Um, I was married for nine years. Uh, my ex-wife is a high-flying corporate executive, and um, we've got three uh, little kids together. They are eight, six, and five. Right on. Right. Yeah, so I've, I've actually been, I've been divorced myself, so been down that road. Well, been there you go. I think, yep. I, think, I think you came to my feed on Facebook or something, and I saw a girl in your photo, so I know you're probably doing pretty well now. Yeah, now I'm, re I'm happily remarried now. I've got, there you a, go. <laughs> got a beautiful, smoking hot wife. So I'm there you happy go. Fantastic. <laughs> I'm, I'm working on that. I'm working. Fig on that. Figured it out. Figured it out. Took me a couple cracks. <laughs> <laughs> We're good. Let's jump into the relevant recruiter, not the yep. relevant. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Yep. Right on, man. So, um, you know, give us a little bit of background. I mean, how did you get into the recruiting industry? You know, it's a short story, but it's a funny story. Um, when I was 25 years old. Uh, I got engaged uh, to a petroleum engineer that works for a Fortune 100 company. And uh, at the time she was making about, I know exactly how much she was making. Her salary was 99,600. And she's a couple of years older than me. You know, I was making probably 65, 70 grand as a 24, 25 year old. And I walked into my boss's office. I said, Bob, I want to raise. I said, I've made you this much money. I've saved you this much money. I was working for a pipe valve and fitting industry. And I said, I want a hundred thousand. And he said, Jeremy, you're an invaluable asset to the team. Um, let me talk to our CFO. I'll come back and get back to you. So he came back two days later, gave me 90 grand. And then I accepted, but then two weeks after that, you know, after it marinated, right. Uh, I resigned and started my first company at 25 years old. And so that company was an email marketing business. So picture like companies would hire me two, three, four, five thousand dollars a month. And then we would do email campaigns to try to sell their products and services. Nice. And I did that for about two years, built it up to about 200 grand in revenue. It was a pretty good lifestyle business as a 26, mm -hmm. 27 year old kid. And, uh, and then I looked at my client base and I was like, shit, man, like half my clients are staffing and recruiting companies. I'm charging them four grand a month and they're sitting here doing 80, a hundred thousand dollars a month in revenue from the shit that I'm doing. So then that's whenever in 2013, I decided to start a recruiting company. Got it. Got it. And that's Encore Search Partners. Well, at the time, we just, re we just changed our business line, but we kept the same name. It was called Market Share Solutions. That was the email marketing company. And uh, then we operated as Market Share Solutions for a few years. And uh, then the oil and gas industry tanked in late 14, early 15. And then Houston, Texas, that's a huge industry for us. So then I started doing email blasts nationwide to try to get clients. And my response ratio was like super low because they thought that we were a marketing company, right? Market share. Right. And, uh, and so then in 2015, we actually rebranded uh, and started calling it on course search partners. So Got it. Got I've been it. recruiting for about nine years. Um, but with regards to, um, you know, how long we've been on course search, it's been a little bit over six years. Got it. So when you first went out on your own, were you a one man show or did you have, did you bring on some other recruiters with you? I mean, how did you, how did you make that transition? Yeah. So you got to remember, I had my staff 
from the email marketing company, right? So right. I had a director of marketing um, who kind of was a jack of all trades, whether it came to marketing or IT and things of that nature, right? Um, and uh, and then I hired my very first recruiter in January of 2013. And the, the reason why I hired him is I was talking to my IT guy and I said, Larry, I want to hire somebody that's kind of like me that I can mold, right? I said, he's got, he, he can't have a degree, right? Because people with degree warrant too much on the base salary. I want him to have played collegiate sports, right? It shows that he's coachable and competitive. And uh, I want him to have a job that's not in corporate America now, right? Because there's a definitive reason why he'll, he'll quit that job to take this one because it's an eight to five Monday through Friday. And then I hear was the last one. I said, Larry, he's got to have a wife or a girlfriend that's fucking hotter than him. <laughs> and, I, and Larry said, why? I said, because you know he's got game, right? <laughs> and I think as a great recruiter, you got to have game. Yeah, right? hell yeah. And, uh, and so with that being said, you know, Larry, we were sitting down at dinner at like Perry Steakhouse or something. And he goes, I know your guy. I know your guy. He used to work with me two years ago. And at the time, you know, uh, he was like a general manager of the coach's sports bar, um, you know, probably making 70 grand, but he had just had a second child. He was working till three, 4 a.m., right? And his wife was threatening to divorce him. Right. And so, you know, obviously he was at a turning point to where he could go from making 70 to joining our company on a, you know, $3,000 a month draw, right? And then get paid straight commission. So uh, fortunately it's paid out, yeah. Excellent, excellent. Is he still with you now? Uh, he was with me for about seven and a half years. And then unfortunately, yeah, it's one of those situations where it's like, this is the top biller. Right. And then, and then somebody else comes in with more talent and then they start getting the A jobs and then they become the top. And then you top grade and you top grade and you top grade. And it was, took an emotional toll on that guy who went from being the top biller, obviously, in 13, 14, and 15, to where now he became number three, four, right? And then he ended up becoming number seven, eight. And then when he comes 10, 11, it, it, we kind of just, time had run its course, right? We had to hug right. it out. And, uh, and uh, unfortunately, I lost him as an employee. And uh, one of the really unfortunate things is I lost him as a friend too. So, yeah, it's always the vision, man. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, I hear that. So I want to go back before all of this happened. You know, listening to some other podcasts we've been on. You know, a big a big part of your story is is your mom being a single mom growing up and kind of how that you know rooted into you. Kind of this, I'm willing to take any risk out there. You know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so you want me to elaborate on that? So my mom had me at 16 years old. Um, so she was pregnant at 15. My dad was 25, so I don't, I don't know how that worked out. <laughs> but, uh, but with that being said, um, you know, my dad left when I was a kid. So I had a single mom. We moved around from apartment complex to apartment complex. I remember, you know, packing the car, you know, at midnight and getting out because we were being evicted the next day, right? And having to go into... To different places. I remember needing to put the apartments in my name at 16, 17 years old because my mom's credit was so bad, right? Um, but what that taught me was no matter how bad things are, right, it, it, you know, as long as you have, you know, your family, right, as long as you have your health, as long as you have a positive mindset, that everything's really going to be okay. And so what that taught me, and it, it's funny because you wouldn't necessarily think that this was the case, but because I grew up so poor, I really don't give a fuck if I lost everything and had to start right. all over again, because I know that money is not what brings you happiness. Right. And, 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 and again, I know that I've got the capabilities, the skills and the talent to rebuild. And so when you go into starting a business with that level of risk tolerance to say, I'll spend a hundred thousand dollars, because I'm going to make $200,000. Right. Man, I'll tell you, man, that is a massive recipe for success. Yeah, it's being able to see it. I, I think that's a huge thing. I was actually just talking to a guy about this is, is you have to put yourself out there. You're not going to be ready to do it. And understanding that if you if you have faith in yourself, you'll return on it, any investment that you, you put out there. Mm -hmm. You know, when you start to look at your money that way. So I think it's really inspiring. And not anything. I mean, don't get me wrong. I've made some bad fucking investments. Right? Well, of course, where, yeah. 
we try to diversify into areas, right? The cannabis recruitment market, right? And I hired two recruiters and you end up spending $60,000, $70,000 before you realize that the margins just aren't there, right? Uh, I tried to develop an app and about $90,000 into the development, we have the MVP ready to go live. Then ZipRecruiter came out with a very similar product, right? And so I've taken some risks and incinerated some money, but I'll tell you, for every single bad investment that I've made, I've probably made five or six good investments that really panned out. Right. Well, you, the only way you can have a good or a bad investment is if you're willing to take an action to, exactly. to do something either way. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's amazing. So with a with the recruiting business, I mean, when you went out, obviously you're transitioning from being a marketer um, to to now being, you know, running a recruiting firm. I mean, what were what were some of the biggest challenges you were facing right away? Well, don't get me wrong, I'm still a marketer. And well, I always will yep. be, right? And so when when you look at how I built this company, never once did I ever run a recruiting business, okay? The second that we started to get job orders, I hired a recruiter. When we started to get more, I hired another one, then another one, and then another one. Today, we have 30 employees. Everybody's a W-2 employee. They get paid a base salary. They've got benefits, PTO, 401k, everything. We're a real fucking company now. Right. right? Uh, my top producer has a team of 17 people that submit candidates to him. He has an ops manager and two assistants that support him. And he's the account manager on $6 million in revenue. So think about how much income that money produces, right? But with that being said, I always wanted to hire somebody else that would find the candidates. And then I would be the one that would do organic poll marketing, right? In order to try to get the job orders in the door. And so I was the account manager, probably on the first million, million and a half in revenue that we brought in. And then those junior recruiters that I'd hired started to elevate and became account managers. And then eventually I just focused on business development. Right, right. Is that I, outside of, you know, leading the team right now, are you still a big part of the business development? Yeah, so I don't even lead the team today, man. I think you're giving me way too much credit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I built the company to about a million dollars in revenue. And uh, I mean, I was stressed out. You know, I talked to Brent Orsuga about this two, three years ago mm -hmm. when he was at a crossroads. Jeremy, do I just hover at six, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars and make it a great living, or do I try to create a real scalable business independent of my own network and, and credibility in the space, right? And so, um, Brent's actually a really good friend of mine, and I understand you've had him on a couple of times. But yep. with that being said, I was about I was about a million in revenue. Uh, we had just had our third child and, uh, we were on a fucking road trip to Savannah, Georgia, which should take 13 hours. And it took us about 23 hours because I had, a, I had three kids under four, right? So I had a newborn, a one-year-old and a three. Um, that's good times right there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so on the drive back, dude, you know, we were already like calling divorce attorneys. We we're like, this ain't going to happen. Like I'm done. Right. And so I started right. venting. I started venting to a buddy of mine who had met through Vistage. I don't know if you're familiar with Vistage. Yeah, but, yeah. It's like a peer-to-peer -peer executive advisory group. And, you know, how old was I at the time? This was five years ago. So I was probably 32. He was like 28. And uh, he was the director of sales and operations for an IT outsourcing company. So he didn't really know anything about the recruiting business. But I was complaining about my recruiters are lazy, right? Um, they don't fill out the CRM. Why do I have to do all the job order intakes, right? Th these guys are calling in sick two, three days a week just because they're putting up production. They're on the golf course. How the fuck do I get my business on track because I'm an asshole to my wife because I'm so stressed out at work? And Scott said, oh, Jeremy, golly, your business is so dysfunctional. So you must be losing a lot of money. I said, what are you talking about, dude? I made $450,000 last year. And he goes, wow, just imagine if you had processes, systems, accountability, emotional intelligence. What if you could yield true productivity out of your employees and stop getting that 20 to 30% waste that they're creating? I said, yeah, it sounds amazing. What the fuck do I need to do? Sure. He said, you need to hire someone to run your company. I said, who's going to run my company? He said, I'll do it. I said, man, I can't afford you. I can't afford you. Told me how much he made. 
I made him a competitive offer that offered a six-figure base plus a percentage of revenue. And that's a sweet deal whenever you make that deal at a million dollars in revenue. Well, this year, we're hoping to do $9 million in revenue. Right. That dude's going to make a shit ton of money. Why? <laughs> Why? Because Scott focuses on the processes, yep. the systems, and the accountability. That way, I can focus on where are we going to play, who are we going to play with, and are they willing to play with us, right? I can focus on innovation and strategy and business development and do the things that I love, which I love doing job order inputs. And I've got the senior recruiter right there with me. Then I hand it to them, and then they take it to the finish line. I don't even see that order again until I get the $45,000 invoice, reports, you know? Right. So I would say that that was really a massive turning point in our evolution um, is whenever I hired somebody to run the company, right? For a, a pretty hefty six figure expense. I didn't try to, 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 you know, pay somebody $60,000 and call them a COO and fucking, you know, right. wait seven years for them to mature into somebody that can grow my business. No, it's always cheaper to buy than to build. That's the reason why our clients come to us. I'd rather just pay you 30 grand to find me a reliability engineer. I don't want to go out and fucking find one. You know? So that that was five years ago. And um, we started implementing a system called EOS, the Entrepreneurial Operating System. Yep. um, Which we've uh, run on for about three and a half years. And I'll say that that's been pretty valuable to our scaling yeah. team. So. I was going to ask you about EOS when you brought up the whole fact that you're the innovator in the company, because I know that's- Yeah, it. so I'm the visionary and he's- You're the, the visionary, yep, yep, yep. No, that's a great, that's a great, uh, great book. Um, I think it's pretty cool that you, you, you've been able to take a look at it. And it's, I think it's classic of what you see in, in a lot of great organizations, which is the leader is willing to step back and surround him with people that are better than himself in these other areas. I mean, how, how important do you think that is? Dude, that's so important. And, you know, I think, you know, you'd mentioned some about my LinkedIn game, right? You know, I think that's the reason why people love to follow me is because I'm not here waving the flag saying I'm the fucking best. I'm sitting here waving the flag saying Christina Lyles, Casey Knight, Scott Kelly, my team are literally the best people in their entire industries, right? Right. So if I can have them on the phone with clients and then I can put a team of associates that are grinders and hustlers to generate leads and to generate candidates, man, that's a massive recipe for growth and success. Right, right. What do you think the thinking is for those that try to, you, you mentioned it earlier when you're talking about hiring on your COO and you could have gone and bootstrapped that for 60,000 versus yeah. like, I'm gonna go all in on this. You know, what do you, what would you say to somebody who's kind of thinking of it? Like, I'm gonna go kind of the, I don't wanna say the cheaper route, but that's really what it is, right? Being cheaper versus like, hey, I'm gonna go find yeah. this person. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the short answer, man. If you're making half a million dollars a year, carve out 150 grand and go get somebody that can help you make two, three, four million dollars a year, right? right? You see what I'm saying? Like, do you really need to make half a million dollars a year? No, your needs are probably met at 350. So it's an investment. Depends on where you live. Depends <laughs> on where you live. But if you're making 150 grand a year as an agency, you probably aren't willing to go into the negative and to take a second mortgage out on your house. Right. Do a home equity loan, you know? And so I guess the short answer is, is if you're killing it, right? If you're making half a million bucks on 800,000 in billings, which there's a lot of small businesses out there, just imagine if you reinvest in right. your people, because we all know that the biggest return you can get on in any investment as an entrepreneur is in people. Right. People are sitting here bragging about fucking Dogecoin and then making 10 X over the last X amount. Dude, I've made 10 X in my fucking business. Right. You know, I mean, it's not going to do it over a six month span. It might take you six years. But the point that I'm making is, is you're never going to outperform the market or I'm sorry, sorry, not outperform the market as long as you're a good innovator and a good executor. Right. What do you think? you know, what do you think has been the key for you to attract the right people to your organization? Oh, authenticity, man. Yeah. You know, what you see is what you get, you know, whether it's out in the social world, whether it's on LinkedIn, whether it's doing speaking engagements, social media, you know, I, I think that being truly authentic, whether you're a fucking dick 
you know, or whether you, you know, believe in saving the whales. Right. People that want to be around you will organically gravitate towards you. Okay. And so, you know, you look at people's person personalities like a Grant Cardone or a Gary V and people like that, right? If you're not here for it, right? Like if you're not excited about that type of style of communication or, you know, what their mission, vision, and values are, then you can self-select out because there's a line of talented people that want to row that same boat in the right direction with you that will be excited about being there with you. So authenticity is key for sure. Yeah, I think you make a great point there. And a lot of it, you know, I mean, with what I do and help people with is on the social media aspect. And a lot of people are so afraid to put themselves out there authentically because they they feel like they're going to cut out a part of the market. And I always really try to remind them that like, hey, you want to do that. You want to, you want to, you want to push a part away so you can attract another part closer to you. Look at, look at what fucking Trump did, man. The guy yeah. ostracized 50% of the nation because, I mean, unfortunately he was his authentic true self, right? Right. But right. then the other half said, I'm going to double down and in, in, in really invest in this guy, right? And it paid off. And yeah. so that's the perfect example of how you can have a polarizing personality and, and beliefs and you could potentially lose 40, 50% market share, but then ultimately gain votes or revenue right? because people believe in that mission vision. Right. Well, I think it's also the mindset of abundance, right? Realizing that there's enough, there's going to be enough people that like me if I want to save the whales or if I want to build a damn wall, you know, it's like, and I think that's one of the things with Trump that I, I bring that up all the time is like, hate him or love him. The guy was good at what he did. There was no questions about his policies and what he stood for. Here's what we're going to do. Here's why. Right. And not saying that he delivered on everything or this, that. I don't want to go politics, yeah. but, but from a marketing it, standpoint, it's the same type of shit, right? Is it's, it's, yeah. you know, it's having an opinion, being able to stick yourself out there. It attracts people to you, just like it's done for your business. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. What are some of the challenges you would say, you know, with your team that you've tried to like really help them overcome, you know, like internally, um, Hmm. I'm trying to think. I mean, we've got a pretty well-oiled machine now um, to where I think that we are very transparent during the recruiting process, the onboarding. Um, we've got very clearly defined KPIs um, and we've invested in every single tool and resource in order for them to be successful. And so I would say that generally speaking, I haven't really had to overcome any challenges um, here recently, right? Um, but what I can say is you know, flashback to three, four years ago, when culturally we were changing from finding candidates on job boards, like a traditional recruiting firm would, to now we're gonna outbound headhunt prospects through cold calling. Well, when you take a team of, let's say five recruiters and you say, hey, you gotta go from making 40 calls a week to now you gotta make 200, that causes a very massive culture shock in an organization, right? And so what I will say is, is one of the things that we did was maybe we kept those people. We didn't fire them because they weren't hitting those targets. But the new batch of people that we recruited in, we made it very clear during the recruiting process, hey, you're going to have to make 200 cold calls a week. And they said, okay. So on day one, what were they doing? They're doing exactly what they committed to in the interview. Right. So then what happened was, is those legacy people would increase their productivity, right? or not necessarily productivity, but their, their effort. Um, and, or they got off the bus, right? right? Well, then the next batch of people that you're recruiting, you got to tell them 400. And then the next batch of people that you're recruiting, maybe you get more sophisticated phone systems, you're telling them 600. So where now, right, when we look at our Monday, you know, our level 10 sales meeting, right? And we look at those KPIs from the week before, We've got people making 2,000 outbound calls a week, right? That's insane. You know, these guys are, 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 are riding up uh, senior VP level stockbrokers on Wall Street that could potentially equate to a $200,000, $300,000 invoice, right? right? And so they know this is a fucking numbers game. I am punching a ticket because I know I can place five of these people in a whole year and I'm going to be a million dollar producer. Right. That's how we elevated it because every batch of new recruits, we raised the bar. Got it. And you got you guys help them build that vision. You just kind of said, you know, hey, here's the reverse engineer. You make these calls, 
if I make X amount of placements, I can build this much. Is that how you kind of get them to attach the vision for themselves personally? No, not necessarily. I'll say that we, so we clearly defined the mission, vision, and values through EOS. Right. And what I'm talking about with regards to them having the vision is when they're sitting in this chair right here interviewing for a job opportunity in our office, um, what we're talking about is Lauren's W-2, Simon's W-2, Kelsey's W-2, right? We're talking about it in the actual interview to where they're creating a vision on day one of saying right. hey, that person's billing 840 and he's in his second year, right? He's got, he's been here two years and nine months. What am I capable of? If I am disciplined and I'm focused, if I do the work, Jeremy will give us the tools and resources. Then we're creating that vision even before they start. Dude. So right. we don't need to recalibrate. We don't need to say, well, let's talk about what your KPIs are and how much money do you make and let's reverse engineer. No, we're saying, we're telling people in the interview, Donnie, this is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. We're saying if you want to make $100,000 a year, you're fired. You get fired if you make $100,000 a year on Coach Right. We don't have any need to have okay fucking producers. The reason why we're the largest privately held executive search firm in the city of Houston, the reason why we've got these awards with growth and best places to work is because we are the best. Because we don't accept mediocrity. I love no it. Our average fee is $47,500. That is the average fee. When we send out a $30,000 invoice, dude, these motherfuckers don't even like walk down to the person down the hall and tell their coworker. It's like it's 100,000 or bust. Right. You know? It's so funny how far we've grown in these nine years, man. Yep. And what's it going to look like five years from now? A lot of people don't know. Right. I'll tell you what I know. You know why I know? Because we implement EOS. We know what our one year, our three year, our five year, seven year, 10 year vision is. Every quarter when we meet and we define those rocks, right? And we IBS every single thing in the building, we have a very clearly defined strategy that's going to take us into the next quarter. Coming out of the last executive offsite that we had back in fucking uh, May, no, I'm sorry, it was April. My president, the guy that I hired as VP five years ago who got promoted to COO, who's now the president of my company, he looked me dead in the face. He said, Jeremy, we need to hire nine people this quarter. I said, oh, fuck. It's exhausting. Right. It terrified me. Not because I didn't have the capital to invest. It's because I got to train all these fucking people. Right. But it was the system that was holding me accountable. Does that make sense? Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, reading reading EOS, I know exactly what you're talking about. The 90 days and the rocks and all that. Yeah, I mean, it's mm -hmm. and that's that's it's really awesome to actually hear somebody who's implemented it to that level of detail. Yeah. Um, and actually, you're living it. You're living EOS. You're 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 you know fully implementing. That's that's pretty imp impressive. Um, what is Do you, are you intentionally breeding this culture of competition? Because that's essentially what's, what, what, you know, it's like you look at, go back into like a Pete Carroll with USC, even at, at, at Seahawks, right? The whole thing with the team is like, hey, bring somebody on. I'm going to bring, I'm going to keep bringing people on that are really, really good that are going to force my top performers to continue to peak because they're always knowing that somebody else is there to, to try to take their job. And it almost sounds like you guys kind of have that same type of mentality where it's like, hey, you're not coming in here to try to be 100K a year, per, you know, producer. Are you doing that intentionally or is that just like? No, I mean, it's a byproduct of yeah. our company core values, right? And so we keep talking about EOS. I'll read mine to you. Mm -hmm. Number one is excellence. Number two is resilience. We know how important that is in commission sales. Yep. Number three is gratitude. Four, coachable, five, meticulous, and the sixth one is competitive. It's a company core value. Yep. So if when we're advertising the role, when we're interviewing for the role, the questions that we ask, right, the behavioral interview that we probe with, right, we're looking for adherence, not necessarily adherence, but excitement about the six company core values. 
Yeah, I think that's I think that's really awesome. And I think it's, you know, so many companies don't even have core values in place that they're actually are they're actually like breathing, living, operating off of those core values. I think it's Absolutely. I mean it's a huge you know, funny, you know, it's funny. I mean, it's a verbal contract, right? Mm -hmm. Where my employees know that that's how we're gonna benchmark whether or not they're being successful or not, because it's not about the revenue on the board. Right. right. We know that there's market dynamics that really influence that. But we know if that you're adhering to these six company core values that you will be successful. But the verbal contract that we made is, hey, we need you to, to, to uh, operate. We need you to eat, sleep, and breathe these six core values. And what we'll do is, you know what we'll do as an executive team? We'll do it too. Right. You talk about gratitude, man. I've got some of the highest paid people in the entire industry. Right. You talk about coachable, man, it was tough to take upward coaching from my vice president, from my COO, but it needed to be done. That's how we could evolve. Right. You talk about meticulousness, resilience, all but very, very, very important. You can't just say, well, that person does a shitty job filling out the CRM, but he's a 600K producer. Or he's got bad write-ups, and so we're just going to hire an assistant that updates his CRM and uh, rewords all of his write-ups before they go to the client. No, it's a core value, dude. Right. I don't give a fuck about your 600K. I can replace a 600K producer. It might take two people to do it, but if you have people that are not adhering to these company core values, man, I'm telling you, it's going uh, it's a massive recipe for disaster. Right. How you do anything is how you do everything. Absolutely. Yeah. Big believer in that. Yeah. You know, I know that you're not like niche is one thing I've noticed. Like you don't have like a necessarily niche. You're, you're. I do. You're, yeah. So let me expand on that. Yeah. Yeah. So in the beginning we were niche, right? We were like, oh, we're going to do oil field services, right? So not just oil and gas, but oil field services. And we were mildly successful. We generated about a million bucks in that vertical. And then we said, okay, we're going to do, you know, wealth management. Okay, we're going to do this. Well, then what we started to do is we started to hire recruiters that would focus in one specific niche. Because the way that my mind thought is like, I'm already paying for LinkedIn recruiter. I'm already paying for Zoom info. Why the fuck am I only doing, right, certified financial planners? Why am I only doing attorneys, right? Because I've already got access to the data. See what I'm right. saying? So our recruiters are actually niched out. Does that make right. sense? Yep, so yep. I've, got, I've got somebody that only recruits partner level attorneys. Another one only recruits associates. Someone that only recruits cybersecurity engineers, oil field salespeople, VP level wealth advisors, senior VP level wealth advisors, independent owners of wealth management firms, VP level investment bankers. So when you look at the company, we're pretty diverse, but then each individual recruiter is an expert in their little subspace. Right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Now, when you when you started, though, it sounds like you were kind of a little bit more niched out. Did you kind of expand into these different verticals after that? Or? Oh, dude. When I was first getting started, I would take fucking anything, dude. Right. Okay. Um, because you need to you need to you need to pay the bills, right? You right. 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 On, you know, um, you know, when we were first getting started, we were probably working 70K jobs, 80K jobs. Then we started consistently getting 100K jobs. Well, now culturally, we say our firm minimum is $25,000 a week. That is like, we will not work on anything that's less than $25,000 a week. I mean, unless it's like, you know, my brother in law's company. Right. And, right, right. You know. <laughs> um, there's, there's exceptions to the rule. <laughs> yeah. Um, but every single year, you just get a little bit more picky, you get a little bit more acute, right? You start turning away the C business, right? You know, you got A, Bs, and Cs, you start turning it away. And then you start focusing on the verticals where you know you've got a competitive advantage. You know what I'm saying? And so that's really what's contributed to us raising the average fee. Right. Now, are those guys now that are running these individual verticals, are they are they running a full desk? Are they in charge of business development as well as the recruiting of that? No. So uh, nobody does business development here. <laughs> and uh, so because of our digital marketing efforts yep. um, and because of um, you know, my presence on LinkedIn, we actually get, you know, a bunch of inbound flow. 
Um, and so right now we've got about 1600 signed fee agreements, whether it's, you know, what, whatever vertical it is. Uh, and then I've got a full-time client development manager to where she sits down and she contacts our existing clients all day long, right? She's probably making 60 to 80 calls a day and sending, you know, twice as many emails. And so she's bringing in two, three job orders a day, right? And those are getting allocated to whoever has expertise in that work. And so while we don't run a full desk in a way that they have to go get their job orders because they're given house job orders, does that make sense? Yep. They are the recruiter and the account manager. So yep. everybody gets paid on both sides of the deal. It's going to be a little bit less than if I were at a full commission, full desk shop because they've got to go hunt for the order too. Right. Right. And so when you look at the profitability in that model, it's actually much higher, right? Because you can take somebody who is a talented account manager and recruiter, and because they've got a full-time business development engine and client development manager, they're now able to produce 700K in production. But if they had to go get their own orders, they would probably do like 350. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes complete sense. Yeah, yep. because it's like, dude, I just get job orders handed to me. Now I got to close them. Right. And so, nothing, get lost, nothing gets lost in translation because I'm the account manager and the recruiter. Oh, and zero of my colleagues are working on the job. Just me. Nobody right. is cross submitting on, on other people's jobs. That's amazing. And I think that goes back into, you know, having a good digital presence and digital marketing strategy really creates like a lot of, of opportunities 100%. for you. Don't get me wrong, dude. It took me years to get here, man. My yeah. Oh, yeah. LinkedIn post, you know, I, I mess with my buddy, Jason Lee, uh, who's now got a pretty good following on LinkedIn. Uh, I say the first one, you're going to get four likes. The next one, you're going to get six. The next one, nine, 13, 18, 22, 31. Right. By the time you're on your 82nd post, you're getting 430 likes. You're getting 583,000 views, you know, whatever the number is. Right. But you got to start somewhere, man. And you can't be waving the flag saying, this is what I do. We don't give a fuck about what you do. Right. Right. We want to talk, talk about the problem that you solve. We want to talk about the person that you help. Does that make sense? A hundred percent. Yeah. We're totally aligned on that, man. I mean, that's, and I think you bring a good, good, good point because I've actually helped a lot of people in the beginning of this journey. And it's like, a, you know, lack of a better way to put it, it's like, you got to eat a little shit to get to where you want to go. You know, like <laughs> social media is, is one of those things that like where most people don't want to put themselves out there is because they don't get that instant dopamine rush of the success that they're looking yeah. for, right? Yeah. Like they want to post and they want to get to the hundred likes. And the reality of it is in a lot of situations, like you, can, you don't need likes and comments and all that stuff to, 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 to be successful on social media, you know, yeah. um, consistent presence and showing up over and over again is critically important. I think that's a great point you make that it's like, it's a journey, you know, you're not going to get the reward on post number one. Um, you know, it's the consistency of getting people to know you and, and yeah, it's not about selling your business. Um, I think that's one of the biggest things that people miss out on is like sales is about selling your business. Marketing is about talking to your market. A hundred percent. Absolutely. I'm trying to think of like, what my most recent LinkedIn post was. I know I got about 400 likes. Um, I said something to you to the effect of, oh, here we go. Five years ago today, I hired my very first vice president, Casey Knight. About four months before that, Casey hit me with a cold LinkedIn message asking to grab coffee. He wanted to learn more about executive search. After seven years of recruiting VP level wealth advisors, he'd gotten burnt out and figured it would be a good transition to recruit CFOs. But after that 90 minute breakfast meeting, there was no way I was going to let him walk away from all that intellectual capital. He just needed the right system to flourish. So I made him an offer. Fast forward to exactly five years later, his business unit has built over $10 million in recruiting fees. They're now a 17 person team and make up for half of our firm's entire firm wide production. I'm so grateful that Casey was open to starting over. And I'm even more grateful that he chose to start over with me. There's a fucking true story, dude. Absolutely, yeah. You know, and these mother, these people, they love it. It's just real. It's authentic. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sitting here saying I'm a fucking recruiter for attorneys. Right. They are. If they wanted to click on my profile, all they need to do is click on it. It says it right there. Yep. Yep. 
No, I think that's great. And, and being able to tell those stories brings human connection, right? Like you said, it's the yeah. authenticity. It's not, it's not, you know, I think incorporating those things in is actually the easiest part of what you can do in your day. <laughs> oh, dude. And people say, well, when, what do I know when to post? What do I know when to post? This is the easiest way. When you get off the phone and you're about to cry, you post it. Yep. When you get off the phone and you're laughing your ass off, you post it. That's it. Yep. That's it. When you're laughing your ass off and when you're crying. There's hey emotion. Guys, hey guys, I just had a deal, right? It was a $47,000 invoice. Dude, I was already looking at the new fucking Gucci sneakers that we're dropping next week. Money was already spent. I already told my girlfriend about it, right? Guy shows, shows up for the interview, sexually harassed the HR manager. She had the offer in hand. She looks him dead in the face, rips up the fucking offer, throws it in the trash can and says, have a good day. Can you believe that motherfuckers actually do this? Question mark. Come on, man. That post is getting 500,000 likes. Yep. Right? Yep. Not a true story. That's why I've never posted it. Right. I only post true stories. Right. But yeah, you're, I mean, it's it, people respond to emotion and laughing, crying, angry, you know, whatever it is. <laughs> You know, and, and I think it's, there's a lot of low hanging fruit out there for people because they're overthinking what content needs to be. And, and I always just say, Hey, tell the stories, of, you know, if you drop value to a candidate on the phone, share it. It's easy. Share it. You don't I, need to. But I don't even want to share drop value. Laugh, cry. Right. Right. So I don't know. Love that's it. My I love it. No, it's, I'm no dining you know, it's, it, no it's dining a style, room. right? And that's the thing is like, what, what works for you is your style. Sure. Yep. Yep. Dude, I love it. I mean, as we kind of wind this thing down here, I mean, what do you think when you look at the recruiting industry as, as a whole, I mean, what do you think are the biggest problems or, or biggest stupidest things that people are doing right now in the industry? Uh, <laughs> independent recruiters keep lowering their fees, right? So they're working out of their house. They're getting a recruiter light license. Um, they've got an Excel spreadsheet of candidates that they printed out from their last job and they're fucking charging 10% fees. Yep. 10 fees, 15% fees. What they're doing is they're hurting other recruiting firms by doing that, right? They think that they need to drop their pants in order to get clients. And that's not the case. Yep. They, they need to respect themselves more. And I'm very proud to say today that we're 25 to 30% shot, right? Um, and in some cases, we're at 33 or even 40, depending on the level of the role, right? Um, but that's one thing that I think that, that, that independent recruiters need to be a little bit more cognizant of is sell on value. Stop selling on price. Right. Because you're actually showing them that you're not on the same playing field right out of the gate. And that's a, that's a very, very messy thing. Yeah, well, it's like buying a car. You're not going to go buy the Mercedes and think that it's luxury if it's priced like a Ford. Yeah, you know, if there's two Mercedes right next to each other and one's 43000 and one's 26000 plain logic seems to think that that one, that something's wrong with that one, right? Right. So. Yep, yep. What are you most excited about, man, as you as you kind of take the next step in your journey? What what, what fires, up, fires you up the most? Yeah, so I'm most excited about... Um, I don't know. Maybe I'm just like so excited every single day to where I don't necessarily know if, if one thing specifically stands out. I'll say that I'm most excited about visualizing an office space. Um, we just re-upped during COVID with our existing space. We didn't want to, you know, move. So we signed on for an additional two years. It's class A office space, but it's a little bit like almost in the suburbs. It's not. Mm -hmm. um, but if you've ever seen the TV show Suits, Right. Yeah, I've seen suits. Yep. 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 I'm most excited about having that office, right? The right. A plus office space, the glass, the high rise, having three floors, having every single one of our employees swagging out in a three thousand dollar suit. You know what I'm saying? Yep. I'm excited about our vision. And in our uh, quarterly town halls, we advertise that vision. We show clips from the TV show suits. So where people know, right? Hey, can I wear this on a Thursday, right? We don't even get those questions because we know what we're working towards. Does that make sense? Yeah, oh yeah, heck yeah. And, and if you're very, very transparent 
and consistent, then the culture kind of works itself out. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of juice in that right there, man. Um, are you, are you intentionally, you know, manifesting and vision like by that? That's Absolutely. Just, yep. Yep. Because yep. some people's vision could be, we want 13,000 global independent recruiters that work on 1099 and get 90% payout, but that's their vision, right? right. It's not our vision. We have no desire to change. Yeah. I want to be 90 employees with the median income of every single individual being $250,000, right? right? That's the TV show Suits. Yeah. We're working towards. So yeah. who do you think I am from the show Suits? I can't remember their names, but Perfect. you're the, uh... I'll tell you who I am for the people that are watching. I'm 50% Harvey and I'm 50% Lewis. <laughs> you're going to you're going to claim some Lewis, huh? Oh, fuck yeah, dude. <laughs> I told you I was divorced. Yeah. yeah you know, you got to have a little bit of, a, uh, of an asshole streak in you. Yeah, Lewis is classic. <laughs> He's sensitive. I'm sensitive, too. Hey, yeah. Don't there let the facade fool you. Yeah, I can, I can fall in the sensitive category. Myself, <laughs> so I know that goes. Um, well, thanks, man. I appreciate you, you you hanging with me today, dropping so much value. I mean, for those that are listening, how can they follow you? How can they get in contact with you? And yeah, so you? LinkedIn is always the best. Um, and then also Instagram, but both are my just just my name, Jeremy Jensen, J-E-R-E-M-Y, last name J-E-N-S-O-N. There's a few Jeremy Jensen's on LinkedIn, but there's only one with a goat emoji right next to it. There you go. There you go. I love it, man. I love it. So you guys heard from the GOAT today, Jeremy Jensen. Make sure I'm telling you, follow him. His shit is fire. Um, Jeremy, leave us with one last nugget. If, if I were a firm owner and I was looking to, Easy. you know, have the success that you have, Easy. what is the one piece of advice you'd give him? Cold calling is not dead. <laughs> well, we might have to fight after that one, but no, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> right on, brother. Well, thank you for being here. And for the rest of you guys, we'll see you next week. We've got Rich Rosen joining us next Friday on the Relevant Recruiter Show live. And if you want to watch this after the fact, we'll have this up on the YouTube channel and podcasts early next week. We'll talk to you guys all very, very soon.